Welcome to today's Pulse IT webinar and thanks for joining us. My name is Jen Bickle Findlay and I'm working with the team at Pulse IT to deliver a series of webinars for the publication. Joining us today, we are pleased to have Professor Ben Bridgewater from DXC Technology in the UK. Ben is a cardiac surgeon and a professor of medicine. Ben was a pioneer in opening up data about outcomes in cardiac surgery down to the level of individual surgeons. Today, Ben plays a leading role developing innovative solutions and guiding healthcare providers in digital transformation. After a brief introduction from Byron Phillips, healthcare industry strategist at DXC, Professor Bridgewater will share a pragmatic journey to 21st century healthcare one that leverages existing investments and provides early efficiency and benefits. If you have any questions for Ben or Byron during this session, I encourage you to enter these into the GoToWebinar control panel on the right of your screen, and I will do my best to have these answered for you today. Today's session will be recorded with the video to be made available to attendees in the coming days via email. The slides from today's session are available right now in the handout session of the GoToWebinar control panel. If you would like DXC to call you to discuss the Lorenzo EMR or their other services in more detail, be sure to include your contact information in the brief survey at the end of this webinar and we will put them in touch. So without further ado, I will now hand the microphone to Byron Phillips, Healthcare Industry Strategist for DXC Australia and New Zealand. Thanks very much, Jen, and may I also express uh, a welcome to and appreciation for so many that have made time to join us today. Uh, as many might know, this is the very first healthcare webinar that we've done as DXC technology. And just to be clear, that was a um, acquisition that saw the coming together of CSC and Hewlett Packard's enterprise business to create one of the very largest ICT services organisations in the world and certainly the largest in Australia and New Zealand. This is very exciting for us from a healthcare business point of view as it increases our dedicated healthcare personnel to just under 20,000 staff and extends our service and digital transformation capability to further complement the very large healthcare software footprint that we have but also to complement the, the growing presence that we have in the infrastructure layer of healthcare, the digital hospital space, our health insurance presence and the payer domain and increasingly in the areas of coordinated care and population health which we're very focused on into the future. A significant amount of ICT investment in healthcare in the past two decades has pretty much been about digitising the digital, sorry, the traditional healthcare processes. While advances have been made by many, it's not been enough. And I think we all acknowledge that in terms of the sustainability looking into the future of healthcare. But if we're able to continue to provide high quality and affordable healthcare, there's a very urgent need to modernize and truly transform the way care is delivered. We're using that word transform a lot and probably overusing it. And yet when we truly think about what needs to be changed and what we're seeing in other industries, healthcare has to take on some significant digital transformation opportunities to make big differences. In non-healthcare industries, digital transformation has drastically improved customer and consumer focus and efficiency. We truly believe for the sustainability of this industry, we now need to do the same in healthcare. I want to stress that we see a focus on the patient as a customer as far more than semantics and with a massive opportunity to improve some of healthcare's biggest issues. To help our clients, uh, uh, <clears throat> sorry, as one of the leading, world's leading end-to-end -end IT services companies that also has a very deep healthcare knowledge, a significant amount of intellectual property, and a large range of partners, DXC is very uniquely positioned to lead a digital transformation of healthcare. To help our clients achieve this transformation, we are taking a platform approach. With our digital health platform and providing customers with a transformation blueprint and a set of tools that speed adoption into new technologies. A critical aspect of this platform approach is that it enables strategic focus and yet leverages the investments that are already on the ground. 
And this is a principle we refer to as anything first as we look to what actually matters in terms of making a substantial difference with informatics. For some customers, the priority is moving hospital applications to the cloud to reduce cost and improve security and a speed to outcome and benefit. For others, the priority is about improving access to information and mobilizing user workflows to enable informed and far earlier decision making that accelerate the care journey. While most healthcare providers recognize the need to be far more customer focused, priorities and strategy will vary, but generally involve the need to extend traditional patient management systems to start improving the customer convenience, the customer's care coordination and operational efficiency beyond the walls of the hospital. A very flexible anything first concept within our digital health platform means that clients can transform according to priorities and existing investments. As we've already heard today, we've got the pleasure of Professor Ben Bridgewater joining us to explain the transformational opportunity of just a few such solutions from within the broader DXC digital health platform. Ben's insights regarding such solutions are extremely valuable as he builds on a 20 year experience in the cardiac, as a cardiac surgeon within the UK's NHS. Ben also ran key national programs, was collected and analyzed cardiac surgeon performance data and responsible for publishing this to drive patient activation and professional quality improvement. It's important that in addition to being a cardiac surgeon, Ben is also a professor of health IT. He's been described by health service journal judges as one of the leaders in measuring quality in the NHS. And today, DXC technology, within DXC technology, he plays a leading role in the evolution of our solutions and guiding healthcare providers to digital transformation. With that introduction, let me hand to Ben to share with us some of the examples of how DXC is helping our clients to modernize and transform. Thanks, Ben. Thank you, thank you, Byron, and good afternoon, everybody there, and uh, good morning here from the very stormy UK. Um, I had uh, uh, the great pleasure, actually, for six months of doing cardiac surgery in Green Lane Hospital in Auckland when it was still in the old hospital there. So I, I remember very fondly that part of the world, and it was a very important part of my, uh, my my clinical training, not just from the cardiac surgical perspective, but also understanding how more patient-centered services can be delivered. And I took a lot of the learning from Green Lane back into the NHS when I came back. I had a very enjoyable career doing cardiac surgery in the NHS, um, but I came to realize that the ability to change things at scale uh, was uh, more moving towards the digital world and away from actually just performing operations, and, and I joined DXC just over 18 months ago. Uh, I had a number of options of places that I could have gone, but the reason why DXC was interesting to me is because, uh, as Byron's alluded to, uh, they have digital transformation experience across a whole bunch of different industries, many of which are now completely changed off the Back, back of that digital journey. And healthcare is, I still believe, in the infancy of this. I think many people who work in healthcare would say it's special and it's different, but everything that I've seen suggests to me uh, that those, uh, uh, those differences are small and the principles which have been so successful in transforming other industries, particularly towards the uh, customer-centric approach, which Byron referred to, actually are completely applicable to healthcare too, and the challenge is just working how that fits together. So DXC uh, has a bunch of different uh, offerings in healthcare and life sciences. Uh, the first is around digital operations, uh, really about improving efficiency and digitizing processes and optimizing infrastructure required to do that. Um, the next kind of layer up, I guess, is the clinical layer, whereby through the various uh, things that we provide, you can drive both clinical operation efficiency to standardize clinical care uh, drive better clinical effectiveness, drive insights out of the care that you deliver to continually improve the quality of care that you give, ensure that you use digital processes to optimize safety, and increasingly moving towards patient engagement where you can start to drive behavioral modification through digital approaches to lead patients to get better outcome. But the other two areas I think are in, 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 uh, as important will become increasingly important. I think everybody recognizes that it's a need to move away from item of service towards value-based payments, and I think people are exploring how to do that. And we have a broad experience, particularly in the US, about the payment innovation side of things, which I think will become more important around the world. 
And the final area is about the digital life sciences. And we know that currently the time and the expense of taking new drugs to market is incredibly slow. So using digital approaches to speed that process up is going to be key to actually giving better outcomes for patients and lower costs to, to health economies. But what we see through digital, and we see this in a whole bunch of different industries, and we're starting to see it now in healthcare, is convergence between all these various areas, where you can start to leverage your clinical data to improve the digital uh, life sciences, uh, uh, life, life, life cycle management process, and payment innovation uh, sitting on top of the other areas to actually drive better value-based care. So I think it's also worth calling out that um, DXC has a bunch of uh, industries, healthcare is uh, particularly, uh, particularly uh, of interest where we go deep, but uh, also insurance, uh, retail, transport. But we have a whole bunch of what we call horizontal offerings, which are things which are necessary to do that. And I won't call out all of these, but I call out three. And I think firstly cloud, and Byron's mentioned, uh, mentioned cloud, but also security. I think we're moving now into an area where the rights and preferences of citizens are key, and you need to have the right security and the right consent models, and you need to have the right digital trust to support the use of these different different approaches. And the other area is analytics, again, where we have a portfolio of analytics services. And the reason for calling these out is because I think healthcare um, organizations need to have all of these capabilities. They don't need them all from us. We obviously provide those things. But I think if you're just thinking about one bit of the jigsaw, you probably won't bring together all the products and services you require to truly take you on a, 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 an important transformational journey. So what I think is fascinating, having a global role in DXC, is traveling around the world and seeing different healthcare systems. And it's quite remarkable how different those systems are, but it's quite remarkable how consistent the problems are. Uh, and those problems are the same right across Northern Europe, Southern Europe, uh, Asia, the States, uh, Australia, and New Zealand. And I think the first area is this increasing complexity and burden of patients with chronic disease. I think it's becoming increasingly recognized that your genes are important in determining your disease outcome. And actually the healthcare you're delivered are important too. But probably the most important thing is your behaviors. And it's those behaviors which are driving up the incidence of uh, chronic disease. And within an, an, an aging population, this is putting a, 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 an insatiable demand on healthcare services. And so to get around that, you need to understand, uh, you need to segment, empower, and start to actually manage the population. Digital approaches is the obvious way of doing that. The second issue, I think, is people tend to access the most convenient services. It's a consumer-driven world. It's not surprising they do that. Uh, and actually, we haven't necessarily all set up the services in a way which mean that patients travel to the right place at the right time. And I think there's a, a real challenge in that in terms of the signposting and actually moving towards a better navigation system across sectors which actually get people to the right place and actually driving that through the payment systems rather than just the current, uh, current systems which have uh, potential perverse incentives in them. We know uh, also that a small proportion of the population and different systems have a different percentage, but a small proportion use a huge burden of the healthcare resource, um, and often that's around and, and, the, and the life care as well, where a large amount of that money is spent. And we also know that tra treatment is varied and doesn't give optimal results. So we know that the incidence of uh, complication from diabetes, for example, varies hugely across geographies, even within a, within a relatively small domain, because of the lack of standardization of the care. And to get that right requires shared uh, information across the system and a joined up approach and using multidisciplinary teams as appropriate and standardized decision support embedded into the workflow of patients. And the final issue I think to call out here is the hospitals are very expensive places to uh, deliver care. It's often the default place and we need to move away to that to ensure that the care is delivered in the most appropriate place for both the patient and for the health economy. So what do we need to transform to, uh, to get to this place? Well, uh, first, I think it's about standardization and optim optimization to enhance and streamline patient flows. And I think there's a lot of learning we can do here from supply chain management across other industries. We need to ensure that uh, safety is, is paramount and we need to eliminate, eliminate the unwanted variation. Move towards this delivery of care in the most appropriate sessions and move towards prevention and more effective management of long-term conditions. And key to all of that is to drive patient engagement, empower, and activation. But it does seem to be particularly hard to resolve these problems. And uh, we called out on this slide some of the reasons why we believe that is. Uh, things have grown up in a fragmented way, and uh, health and social care is often siloed. Uh, and the culture within those organizations, both in terms of the organizational culture, and particularly the professional culture, isn't necessarily driving the changes which I think patients and health economy needs. So getting the uh, operating models right and getting the culture right within those organizations is key to get a better outcomes. You can put a very advanced digital platform uh, in an organization with, a, with the wrong operating model 
and you won't derive the benefits that you're looking for, particularly if the benefits you're looking for are cross-sector and actually that's only done in one part of that sector without the right kind of uh, uh, stakeholder relationships around, around there. Uh, to bring together to data, it has some significant uh, challenges with data integration. Uh, for example, there's a lot of structured data, but there's also a huge amount of unstructured data out there, and you need to, 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 to bring those things together on the right platform to be able to do that. Uh, once you get a digital system, it's often that you get a huge number of, uh, often there's an industry standing up different views of that data, but often the insights that you're deriving don't have any actions associated with it, and therefore you're not getting the transformation you require. So it's key to actually tease out what are the actionable insights and actually avoid some of the challenges you get when you start to get information overload from all the data that's flowing through the system. The system. And the final area there is around citizen behaviours, uh, which uh, seem to be uh, un 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 unchecked by and large. So when you put those various four things around the edge, th the result is often you're getting minimal transformation, and often people aren't getting the return on the investment that they're placing in the digital assets uh, that, they, that, that, they, that they purchase. So it's important in terms of getting transformation to have a holistic view of this and work out how your digitization fits together with the other important uh, uh, enablers to, to drive, a better, drive you to a better place. So what do we believe are the necessary digital transformation capabilities? Uh, well, firstly, it's about acknowledgement of the rights and preferences of citizens. As you move towards a more consumer-centric and more customer-centric approach, acknowledging those rights and preferences is key. And obviously, if you want to share the data for their best interests and for health service best interests, they need to have the trust in the way you will look after that data, uh, uh, trust on who will see that data, trust in who you will use that for. So backing up the, the rights and preferences of citizens with mechanisms for digital trust is key. We obviously need to transform operations and you get benefits just from transforming operations within an organization, but you get more benefit if you start to transform that across the ecosystem. Uh, we also need to start leveraging all the other things that happen, speech and imaging processing capabilities, for example, uh, data-driven clinical decision support to start to standardize care. Uh, we know that the Internet of Things will have a real place in terms of uh, transforming outcomes. I have to say, I don't think we know exactly what that place is. Uh, many people are very excited about the capabilities of home monitoring, for example, to pick up things early and keep people in the normal place of residence. I think the, the theory is running ahead of the evidence on that, but it will certainly have a place. Um, using the Internet of Things within a hospital, for example, to optimize the uh, and streamline the care is, is key as well. But obviously using the Internet of Things uh, raises further challenges around the volume of data that you've got, driving the insights out from that data, uh, and uh, uh, keeping that data secure, particularly as you start to flow more personal health care data onto the right platform. And I guess the final thing here, which may, may possibly be the most important thing on here, along with the acknowledgement of rights and preferences of citizens, is moving towards a, uh, a place where all these uh, organizations are run by 21st century executives with 21st century professionals who understand how technology can fit together with their clinical practice and how can start to mold their practice uh, to be an optimal practice to work in a digital world rather than insisting that the digital needs to move towards their existing practices and I think that's a challenge for all systems around the world as well. So what do we need to support this transformation? Well, what I want to just call out here a little bit is the way we see the world uh, and that's on, on the three blocks on the right. We have your systems of record and that can be primary care data, secondary care data, it can be patient health data, but those systems of record are absolutely key. Uh, systems of record on their own don't really give you very much and the systems of insight, the analysis that you can provide to that is important, particularly around segmenting the population. But those again are only limited value unless you have the systems of engagement right and it's those systems of engagement and how you do things with that data which is absolutely key. So what do we need to support the transformation? Well, we need to have the right sort of patient administration systems, ideally ones which work across sector but certainly ones which are very effective within those sectors. We need to have clinicals to standardize the care drive drive greater patient safety, drive further insights to help to start to refine uh, clinical care and to support some of the convergence ideas that I, I talked about at the, top, uh, at the top. Obviously, you get more value if you get that data integration right, but the engagement tools are absolutely key. And if you can bring those things together, and then you can start to drive multidisciplinary collaboration right across the sectors. You can start to manage flows right across the sectors and start to take the right cohorts and coordinate their care in a way which is better for the patient's outcomes and better for the health economy in terms of the money spent to get the outcomes that you want. And obviously, you need to have the embedded ability to undertake the risk analysis and stratification to start to target individual patients who maybe have missed opportunities for better care 
or to start to target cohorts who you can actually start to manage better by optimizing their care as well. So within that, you've obviously got the patient administration system, and many people are on on-premise uh, legacy PaaS uh, uh, systems, and that can do a, a very effective job. But I think everybody's working out how that PaaS system will fit into a, a wider agenda where you're starting to support business and clinical transformation with all the things that we know need to be done, and how the PaaS um, fits in there. And we believe uh, it's an important step to move to uh, to a next generation PaaS something which is uh, web-based, cloud-enabled, uh, that could be a fully managed service. Uh, you can have a, a single instant strategy whereby everybody's always on the, on, on the latest and greatest updates. And that starts to give you a path to fire compliance, which means you can start to uh, plug and play these new uh, systems of engagement as, as required. That will start to give you the care logistics optimization and the standardization as well. So we think this is an important part of the journey, but as Byron was calling out at the top, uh, we believe in a anything first type strategy whereby people were making the right priorities for them about where in this particular part of the journey they want to go want to go next so we've um, configured uh, our, our system uh, to, su to support this uh, this is a sort of generic global thing I think it's a digital health platform uh, in, in, in Australia and New Zealand whereby what you have at the bottom is is open health connect which is really our uh, next generation integration approach to bring all this data together and fire enable it to enable uh, things to be done um, above and beyond. Uh, there will be a bunch of partners, technology partners that people work with to do this because no company can provide all of this stuff. We have Lorenzo Care Suite with the common services, the patient administration systems, uh, which, which can work uh, either within a hospital or cross sector. And then we have all the specialist care services uh, as, as, as we called out there. Um, and uh, the two areas I think which are uh, particularly interesting today are around the professional care, care user interface and we recognize that the kind of interface required for a social care worker for example is different from the type of interface required for a doctor and therefore different um, uh, plug and play type interfaces are, are necessary to drive the optimal engagement of the professionals. Uh, and similarly around citizen user interface, so you can configure the citizen user interface for the needs of that particular citizen and you can start to drive a behavioral change things through that citizen user interface to start to change the behaviors which then change the disease outcomes for everybody's benefit. So the way this works is uh, described here. So I, 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 I wouldn't want to go into the details of all of this today, but uh, we have people who can come and, and, and see, see, see you and explain this in, 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 in great detail. But I guess in essence, this is the architectural uh, kind of diagram, but what you have here is really some very simple concepts. The first is about integrating multiple systems of record, and that can be primary care, secondary care. Um, it can be within uh, secondary care, it can be clinicals, it can be pharmacy, it can be claims and payments data. Um, uh, but what it can also be is Internet of Things data, and that's Internet of Things data within an organization, or Internet of Things data which flows from a patient's home, or Internet of Things which uh, flow from people's uh, own devices, diabetes management records, for example. Uh, we then have these multiple systems of, of engagement which will work on the basis of the embedded uh, analytics. And uh, we have analytics embedded in this platform, but we also have an ability to plug and play uh, the next uh, next best thing in, in, in cognitive computing as those things uh, accelerate in terms of their capabilities. So key to this is this concept of uh, uh, what we call anti-fragile IT. So uh, it's the 10-year anniversary of the iPhone. I think uh, 11 years ago, nobody had predicted the iPhone and nobody had really predicted um, what what uh, effect that would have on, 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 on all of us around the world, apart from the clever guys at, uh, at Apple. Um, and what I think we could all do is sit down and scribble down the top three things which we think will change healthcare delivery in the next five years, and I suspect the vast majority of us would be wrong. I suspect the things which are really going to have a big difference and change the dial are things that nobody's kind of thought of yet. Uh, and so we believe in this concept of anti-fragile IT. Uh, a lot of the systems of record stuff is very stable, uh, and actually uh, it, you need to leverage that, but that's not going to change enormously. And actually the investments in IT should be about making sure all that stuff is safe. But the other kind of smaller area is, is being prepared to be able to use these new things that happen, which nobody's predicting. So the concept of being able to, to deploy the next best digital therapeutics approach or the next best cognitive computing approach or the next best artificial intelligence clinical decision support on top of your existing uh, and safe uh, uh, systems of record is absolutely key to driving to, 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 to better outcomes. 
So I just want to give you some examples of, of, of where we've done done this at, at, uh, uh, in different ways. So I guess in terms of bringing together huge amounts of data, uh, we've worked with New York Presbyterian, which is a, uh, a hospital and primary care system uh, across a whole bunch of different organizations, all using a plethora of different um, uh, um, systems of record. And they were recognizing that they couldn't flow the data to the right place to drive better, better, better outcomes. So we developed Open Health Connect uh, with them, powered by Viaduct, which is our integration engine. And that uh, works interoperatively with a whole bunch of systems, including Cerner, all scripts, et cetera, et cetera. And we are exchanging over 15 million messages a day. And we're using that then to try and drive better quality of care, better insights, segment the population, target better, 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 better insights through a New York Presbyterian. And we can show details of this, uh, share details with us in much more detail if you're interested. The second um, is more about business intelligence. So this is a place we, we, we're doing some work within the UK. Uh, who've been running on our uh, EPR system and are very rich in terms of their systems record. They have huge amounts of data uh, and they uh, were finding difficult extracting the insights of the data which was really transforming their business. So we started to work with them in a consulting-led way to say, say what are the things that you would like to know which you could do something about which would really start to train, tr change your outcomes. And so we've worked with them and we started to apply this next generation predictive analytics to move away from just looking at what had happened in the past or what's happening right now, to start to predict what was going to happen next so they could start to transform their business on the basis of that. And the third area is around a system of engagement. So we're building up here systems of record, systems of insight, systems of engagement. And this is a next generation digital care coordination approach in Trafford. Uh, whereby they were trying to improve the outcomes for their patients and decrease the pressure on their hospital services. And they were making a more and more complicated healthcare landscape and they wanted that simplified. So they asked us to work with them and pull together a data integration approach uh, to do some analytics and segmentation and start to do signposting, uh, referral management, discharge management and care coordination. So we pulled together all the information and consent management stuff that I talked about, which is essential for the digital trust area. We are onboarding patients with complex needs onto this platform. We were actively managing those patients and now using uh, customer relationship management approaches. And we're getting increasing evidence of very high patient uh, satisfaction and better outcomes for the health economy due to uh, omission avoidance in terms of the way we target these people with complex needs. I guess the, um, the other thing that I think we need to call out is moving away from uh, thinking about this just as a reactive healthcare service to be, to be more proactive and starting to think about um, uh, things from a consumer's perspective. So we've been doing some work with a, a, a high profile uh, children's hospital who wants to move to a new location and be born digital and uh, start to think about that from their perspective perspective and then you start to think actually what is a hospital all about uh, and actually it's not just about what happens when you're poorly it's uh, about the thought po thought points and the touch points and how can you actually have a uh, digital brand and presence which supports uh, patients from the very first time they think about you and actually starts to get you high in their esteem which starts to help them get better experiences and better care this is a particularly interesting group because uh, the patients are the kids and the carers are not and depending on exactly the age of the kid they will want different different stuff uh, and they will want those services to be delivered in different ways. So you need to have persona-specific digital challenges and offer offerings in terms of supporting that. Uh, these digital channels will support these new ways of care delivery, uh, collaboration, particularly for specialist children hospitals working with um, uh, district children hospitals want to give as much remote care. You want to, want to start to moving into chat, video consultation, a chat box as required, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously, you need to uh, start to work the right culture uh, in this. And again, this concept of anti-fragility in terms of what you do in terms of your, your, your digital investments there. So again, in terms of a, a, a patient journey, my daughter actually, she's six. She's just had a, had a quite a big operation, and uh, it all starts. And we've been through all this all, all this with her. It starts with hearing about the hospital and referral, getting the right appointment at the, at the right time for you. Uh, the admission, the follow-up, the discharge. And the sort of questions that I was asking the hospital and the sort of questions she was asking the hospital were very different. She was asking, can I bring my teddy? Um, you know, can my mum stay with me when we're there? What's it like in hospital? Who's going to be looking after me? All that kind of stuff, which were very different from the, the things that I was asking. And uh, obviously, you can start to apply different approaches to that technology and different channels for that technology, depending on the needs of the particular persona. And we work this through from a patient's perspective, a, pa a parent's perspective, a hospital worker's perspective, a hospital manager's perspective, and also from researchers' perspectives as well, who are important players in this particular game as well. 
So um, we, we recognize that these different systems of engagement can plug and play. And what we've done is we've called out some of the things that we've got here in that systems of engagement. Clinical aid, which is a, a something to make it a better experience for doctors. Nurse aid, which enables the nurses to do all their their tasks uh, more efficiently, uh, facing to the patient, and gives them, gives them more more time to care. Um, patient aid, which we've talked about as well, and also the customer relationship management. We've bought a company very recently called Tribridge, who are a leading deployer of Microsoft Dynamics into healthcare with a product called Health 360, which is really interesting. But the one thing we just did want to show you uh, now as an example of how those uh, uh, different persona-specific systems of engagement works is clinical aid. And I'm going to hand over to Delia Dent, who will just take us through a brief demonstration of some of the functionality of that. Okay. Thank you, Ben. All right, so I am going to give you just a very quick demonstration of Lorenzo Clinical Aid. So coming up on the screen in a moment will be my view. Now, I'm showing you this through a browser today, but it is actually a mobile app. And I am logged in as a clinician. So let's just start over here. So I'm, I'm Gregory House today, and I'm able to just in in one click I can find my patients or I can look by ward or, or favorites. I can also set up preferences depending on how I like to see my patients but for now I'm just going to go into my patients and I'm going to take a look at Rebecca Adler. Now what I've got over here is a, a summary slide and this sort of gives me a, a very quick overview of, of this patient. I can see that I've, there's some alerts, some allergies, there's a few documents and procedures. So I could I could navigate through these tiles or I can use the the buttons down the side here. So there's sort of two ways that I can I can go through things. So I'll just come back to my starting place here. Um, so what I'm going to do first is just look at some results, check um, what's been going on with her, a few things have come in. So I can look at the, the full blood count. And I can also plot these in a, in a tabular form. Um, I should explain also that the information that's feeding into this system is a combination of um, coming from the patient administration system and also clinical information system. So here we've got laboratory information coming in. And it's all at my fingertips and I'm able to see what's happening. And likewise, I can also get documents. There's integration to these other systems. I can see an x-ray image and that's really helpful if I want to talk to a patient at the bedside, explain to the family what's happening. <clears throat> and I can also get information about what we've been doing with this patient, so what kind of procedures have been performed, some details about those, and likewise with, with visits, so what, what have we been doing with those people. And I can see contact information. So this is coming in through the, um, the patient demographics from the PAS. Now, this is not just a, a viewing system. This is actually, um, we're able to, to not only access information from several different underlying systems, but we're also able to push information out. So, for example, I might be talking to my patient about um, you know, taking history and saying, well, what are your allergies? and there might be something that I need to update. And I can do this through the system. I can also order new tests and medications. So that's just a very, very quick view of Lorenzo Clinical Aid. Um, we're launching this now. So um, if you're interested, we can, we can show you in greater detail. So um, get in touch with us afterwards. So Ben, I'll hand back to you now. Thank you. So that just gives you an insight into um, a system of engagement for, for clinicians, clini clinical aid. And the reason why we think this is uh, the right way to go is because uh, we see the ability for very rapid advances in some of the usability through these kind of uh, products and also for implementing things like next generation clinical support. And so on the top of these very stable systems of record that you have uh, right throughout uh, healthcare, you start to have this rapid innovation in terms of these systems of engagement to start to drive this transformation agenda to a different place. So um, 
the, the, the final thing we're just going to talk today, and, and I won't demonstrate this to you today because of time and give some opportunity for some discussion, uh, but is the idea of moving towards a digital health marketplace whereby you start to leverage in a structured way on top of all the stuff that you've got in the clinical ecosystem of the innovation which is coming from the market, particularly about applications and this concept of digital therapeutics driving, pe driving people to, to behavioral change through using their smartphones uh, and their tablets and actually but curating that so people get some kind of ability to do that. Uh, we have a product which uh, we would demonstrate if we had more time called Diabetes Digital Coach and it's a really, I'm super excited about this, whereby people can register themselves for better diabetes care or can be referred for better diabetes care by their, their, their clinical team. They, they sign up to this themselves, it's all secure, it's all cloud-based, uh, then they, they, they have a bunch of questions asked about them and then this will then push approved digital applications to them and they may be about better diabetes management, they may be about, 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 about diet control, they may be about driving better exercise or they may be about wellness and mindfulness and some of the th things that we know people really suffer from particularly with type, type, type 1 diabetes. Uh, but as well as driving those apps it also enables you to flow data onto the cloud where you can start to monitor your wellness and your disease, you can start to get alerts for how often uh, your diabetes is not well controlled and by doing this you start to activate people and start to encourage them to get better outcomes but this is all curated through a digital platform and again this is something else which sits on top of the, um, the, 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 the healthcare digital platform which we've put together. So just uh, in, in summary we know that all healthcare systems are struggling and people are finding it really hard to, 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 to get over, get to get to get done the things they need, they know they need to do. Uh, I think the technology is definitely going to help but it's the, uh, the novel operating models and cultures I think are required which will really drive transformation. Technology is, is required and uh, we need to build on all the technolog technology in place and that's both in the application and in the infrastructure landscape. Uh, we've, and we've configured uh, uh, things to, to, to help us um, uh, to, get, to get there uh, through, 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 through Open Health Connect and we believe that the uh, PAS, uh, 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 next generation PAS move is one of the first things in terms of driving that agenda. Uh, so with that I will hand, hand back to the organisations, I look forward to some discussion. Thanks, Ben and Byron. We've received quite a few questions during your presentation, so let's address as many of them as we can right now. Uh, just a reminder that if you'd like to ask any questions, you can do so now by typing them into the question box on the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, I've actually um, got a question. I like the vision, but I'm wondering uh, what parts of this can I use now as a clinician, for example, to improve operational efficiency, patient focus and clinical decision making? So maybe Byron, you might be able to answer that for me. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, I think that the, first of all, that, that uh, our concept of anything first is absolutely key to this, so that organisations can start with the things that matter and real things that are available now uh, to get those improvements and it's not always about changing big back-end systems. So the area of care logistics and so on we see is very, very important to applying that customer thinking. Why are we not mapping the entire journey of the customer like an airline does and the efficiency we can get all the way through to the back-end? Those are things that can be done now. The mobility piece done properly to the audience it is absolutely key. We know that it gets adoption and we also know that it speeds decision making in healthcare immensely when a clinician can make a decision and keep the healthcare workflow happening before his work, uh, his ward round uh, the next day. The ripple effect of that through length of stay and capacity management is immense and in some cases hundreds of bed days a year. So there's, there's numerous examples that can be done now and I suppose if we go to the big end of town around population health and, and Ben alluded to it where we're using customer relationship management tools, so non-traditional tools in healthcare and applying them to healthcare and we're seeing massive benefits all the way through to things like ED 
and the right people turning up at the right place in time, an end of life patient not being in ED and so on, being managed better through a customer relationship management system as an example. So this concept of anything first and many, many options where we can make a difference is key to where we're going. Ben, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yes, um, I, I think you've covered it really well there, Byron. I think um, I, I think what we've tried to show you today, I think we've tried to sort of paint a vision uh, about where we believe 21st uh, century healthcare is going, and uh, particularly this concept of anti-fragile. We don't know exactly where it's going, but we know there's some things that you, you will need to do to take advantage of all the all, all the uh, improvements that are happening. But everything that we've showed you today. Uh, is uh, exists, so we're not showing you any kind of things which which don't exist. They they exist in slightly different um, levels of maturity. So, for example, Lorenzo Paz is a very mature uh, uh, thing that that we have. We have deployed uh, Microsoft Dynamics CRM, uh, as as Byron said, uh, you know, at scale, uh, and we alluded to that. Uh, the integration approach is used at scale. Viaduct is used at scale uh, around about the place, and all the other things are built out in terms of at least proof of concept or minimal viable products. Uh, and 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 we're going to market uh, in, in a staged way with all those different engagement approaches. But I think what is really key is that if you look out there, there's a whole bunch of point sort solutions uh, which you are, are you can buy today, but actually uh, will not necessarily change the dial in terms of your transformation approach unless you see them as more of a holistic solution for where you're going and we see some of these key things which underpin that as critical to getting the transformation you, you require. Thanks for that uh, both Byron and Ben. Uh, we have a question from Peter about clinical aid. Can doctors look up any patients in Lorenzo or just their patients? So, so, so two parts to that question too. Um, one thing I want to make really, really clear is that clinician aid um, is a core element of Lorenzo's mobility, but its entire design is to sit over underlying systems, not just Lorenzo. So that, that's the first thing. To then get to that question is the security and policies and so on are absolutely key to be able to configure both of those options to allow patients um, by the correct clinical staff, at the same time options that allow the break the glass options and so on are key in Lorenzo as well um, in necessities to look at a patient record. So that's a complex area around consent and all sorts of things, but the technology is not stopping the managing of those two things. <clears throat> Thanks for that, Byron. Uh, the next question. How do clinicians share information from Lorenzo? What import export capabilities does it offer? And that's from Karen. Shall I pick that one up, Byron? Um, I think there's yeah, there's, there's, there's different um, different ways that um, you can you can share information. This is really an interoperability question. There's different strands of, of interoperability in here. So uh, what we ha have uh, in terms of a lot of the standard contracts in the UK is um, a an extract facility whereby every 24 hours, every four hours, every hour, whatever it happens to be, you can extract the data from Lorenzo uh, into a data warehouse which enables you to start doing stuff with it, which enables you to share it in, 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 for business intelligence, share it with uh, researchers if you've got the right encryption, etc., etc. So that's one strand. The second is about desktop integration. It's very effective in terms of desktop integration, so we can show the relevant data if you have the right security and role-based access into different systems, or you can show different systems in, into, in, in, into Lorenzo um, as well. But I guess the, 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 the key area on this is actually uh, thinking about the, uh, the true interoperability approach using, using APIs, and particularly through Open Health Connect, which enables you to share the relevant bits of the clinical record or, or, or other issues that you want with the, with the relevant people to actually drive that better care. And that's key in this whole concept of um, connect, uh, care, collaborate, transform that actually the whole interoperability play for Lorenzo is to drive you towards that transform thing by giving different options for that interoperability approach. Thanks for that, Ben. Now, this is an excellent and contemporary question 
from uh, Mahmoud. Do you see blockchain technology as a game changer in healthcare IT? And how soon do you think we will see some degree of implementation of it? <laughs> that's that's a great question. So um, I uh, don't think anybody knows the answer to that question. Um, I think that there's a huge amount of interest in, 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 in blockchain. And I think when you look at one of the points I called out earlier in, in this, uh, dealing with the rights and preferences of citizens and using blockchain so you can actually be clear what's shared with who and have those audit trails around what's shared with who seems, 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 uh, seems right and proper. I think there are some kind of questions about the scale, scalability. I'm not a technologist, but as, as I understand it. We have uh, at DXC got a scale deployment of blockchain in, in healthcare in China, actually. So we do have some, uh, some expertise in that, and we have a lot of our kind of deep technology people thinking about exactly what is the place of blockchain uh, in healthcare. So I, I guess in terms of a one-word answer to the question, the answer is probably. But I would encourage um, uh, the the, uh, the 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 further dialogue, I guess, with our local uh, uh, representative expertise to kind of get under the under the skin of that, and and we can update you with what our our point of view on that is specifically, and give you some examples of what we're currently doing. And that's an excellent answer, <laughs> given we we're, we're talking about blockchain. Um, another uh, very good question from Andrew. Do we need next generation PaaS in order to use FHIR to query ADT and demographics data? No, no. Um, so uh, a key part of that Open Health Connect platform is to acknowledge that organisations can't swap all that stuff out to get some of the benefits we need. The newer systems provide additional function but we're doing work, for example, um, in New York Presbyterian to take HL7 outcome outputs and actually convert that to fire standards so that we can actually get faster use then and open up the number of people who can do things like write mobility applications across the top of healthcare. Certainly in the work we've done, the use of fire, whereas once upon a time the, the developers would have had to understand things like HL7 in a lot more detail, it's allowed us to increase the number of people that we can put on the development side without deep knowledge of healthcare messaging and so on. But that clinical aid, for example, is designed to sit over other systems. I'm not saying every system in the world, but certainly legacy systems, not just Lorenzo and next generation applications. <clears throat> Thanks for that, Byron. We have another question from uh, Karen. For the private sector, what capabilities are being developed to use the information to support billing or claims and or payments? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, certainly going forward, and I think in the last um, uh, Lorenzo webinar we did, the question was asked about our direction around billing. Um, we are going to be leveraging a partner there around uh, Power Solutions. Uh, so we want to make that clear for a start where we've previously embedded billing in the secondary care systems. We're needing to acknowledge that consolidated billing across the whole of healthcare needs to be uh, more prevalent. And to do that in this, not just in this country, but we're partnering with Power Health uh, in other, uh, other countries as well to deliver the billing elements of um, our systems. And for those that aren't, aren't aware of that, um, that, that, that organisation, um, got a lot of implementations here in Australia today. Um, we're more than happy to, um, to talk about that. Thanks again for that, Byron. Now, this is a very interesting question in the context of um, Australia at the moment. Um, this is a question by Anna. What role do you see the Australian government playing in helping to digitise health? That is a hundred dollar question. Um, <laughs> look, I, I guess it's interesting because the timing, I'm in New Zealand at the moment, they're going through um, challenges at the moment about how they're going to address some of the things that Australia did around things like my health records and uh, personalised health records and so on. Um, 
there is some infrastructure elements that we absolutely need at, at a national level um, to speed the improvement of healthcare across organisations. However, if I could only choose one, I'd be aiming at the funding mechanisms and levers across healthcare from primary care, secondary care and so on. They are in many cases anti-coordinated care and the flow of a customer across healthcare. So if you didn't even touch the healthcare standards and piece, um, health records and so on, and actually made the funding support the flow across the entire ecosystem, I think uh, if, for my money that would be my uh, where I'd be putting the effort. Ben, I don't know if you can touch on what's happened in other industries that might be relevant here. You've worked down here. Yeah, so I mean, it was, it was a while ago I worked down there. No, I, I, I don't think I've, uh, I've got a, a lot to add. I mean, I, I think uh, there's some very interesting um, dynamics that, 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 that flow through as a consequence of national policy. So uh, uh, in terms of the UK, for example, Connecting for Health was this big, big, big thing and a lot of money went in and actually there's a perception that it was a complete disaster. I'm not sure that's right. I think uh, certainly primary care now is very digital in, in, in the UK as a result. Uh, I think a lot of hospitals went from nowhere to being somewhere reasonable in terms of their, 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 their kind of, uh, certainly their, 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 uh, their uh, patient administration systems, etc. off the back of it. But when you have a sort of centrally led uh, approach to something like that, that has consequences afterwards as well. It has consequences in terms of the mentality of the people who are expecting to be uh, have those services delivered. It has consequences in, in terms of the organisations. A lot of organisations uh, 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 were decimated by by that particular particular approach. And I think everybody is really cautious about making sure that national policy is right, uh, not just in terms of getting the the intent, but in terms of uh, adverse consequences you get out of those national programmes. But I guess it's very much sort of context specific, which is why I don't think I've got very much to add to what Byron said. Thanks for that again, uh, both Byron and Ben. And certainly, um, Anna, you would be aware that the Australian Digital Health Agency released its strategy last month, so that might be a useful document for you to read because it actually does outline how Australia is going to approach um, the whole digitisation of our healthcare. Um, so the next question, and last question in fact, how might Lorenzo and clinical aid drive economies of scale for chronic disease management and aged care? That's from Michael. So shall I shall I pick up that from a from a from a clinical perspective? Yeah, so, absolutely. Ben. So cr for chronic disease management um, uh, f for me, uh, y y you need to get the balance right uh, from doing what the um, uh, informing, empowering and activating the patients uh, on the one hand and delivering the right clinical care on, on the other hand. And I think uh, there's a temptation with technology to run ahead of the evidence base rather than kind of respond to the evidence base. So if you look at COPD, for an example, uh, you can segment the population uh, in people with COPD. And actually, the real strong evidence base around that is that what people require is uh, ubiquitous flu vaccination, uh, smoking cessation counselling, weight loss, greater mobility. And those are the things which give you the greatest bang for your buck in terms of chronic disease management of COPD. You will, of course, have other people who have very severe uh, COPD who are on end-of-life pathways, and what those people require is a very much more customer intimate approach, whereby they need to have bespoke um, uh, pathways uh, and management plans, integrated care plans for them, which they will, they'll need to have co-created with the relevant expertise, and that expertise may come from just respiratory medicine, but it may well come from other specialties as well, because often those patients have multiple comorbidities as well. And that integrated care plan needs to be available and needs to be shared. So at the heart of this, I think you need to have uh, robust systems of record. You need to have the systems of insight to segment the population. And then you need to have the smarts to deliver the right kind of care to the right segments in that population. And then you need to use the available digital tools to support that. 
and some of that will be around uh, Lorenzo and, and clinical aid in terms of managing those patients but we believe a lot of that kind of care management should probably come from customer relationship management type approaches which sit above and beyond and are one of these systems of engagement which enables you to manage those disease processes in a better way uh, and using different multi-channel approaches. So for example, driving through vaccination, that's not about a customer intimate approach, that's about operational efficiency to ensure that's done, ensure that it's always done and chase those things up to get that to those rates to as high as possible. But obviously much more customer intimate, particularly towards the kind of far end of the disease process, which needs to be supported in different ways. So I think Lorenzo and Clinical Aid have got a real role in that, but I think the analytics and CRM approaches are, are what's really required to drive that kind of pro approach at scale. And then pushing those behavioral changes, so for example, driving uh, greater mobility to do auto pulmonary rehabilitation, drive the weight loss, etc. Uh, supporting better smoking cessation through patient aid would be one of the ways I think you get a better outcome for those co cohorts of patients. But you need to be specific for the dif different disease processes. So you can have a similar discussion around diabetes, a similar discussion about atrial fibrillation prevention, but I think the principles are the same. Uh, thanks for that again, Byron and Ben, and uh, certainly I was uh, fortunate enough to have a demonstration of Lorenzo at HIC last month in Brisbane, and the flexibility of the system was um, what impressed me, and that's so important, looking particularly at integrated care and the chronic disease management, as um, Ben has talked about. We're just about out of time, so I'll start to wrap up the session now. I'm sorry if not all the questions were answered uh, in the time frame. Uh, thank you for attending today's Pulse IT webinar. I trust you found the session informative. I'd like to acknowledge the support of DXC and thank Professor Ben Bridgewater for the informative presentation and Byron Phillips for your introduction and involvement. The recording of today's webinar will be made available to attendees, so keep an eye out for this in your email inbox in the coming days. I encourage you to share the video with any of your colleagues who may not have been able to attend the webinar today. Contact details for DXC are now on your screen. I'll leave the session open for another minute to give you time to write down these details. While you're doing that, a reminder that if you would like DXC to call you to discuss any queries you have about today's presentation, be sure to send us your contact information via the brief survey at the end of this webinar and we'll put them in touch. Thanks again and goodbye. <laughs>